Now, I want you to see this verse. It says, as thy days, let's all say it. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Say it again to each other. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now, this goes opposite of the way the world tells us. You know, when you go to a doctor and you tell them, and have you noticed recently when you go to a doctor, all right, they'll tell you, oh, this problem, never mind, you know, it's part of aging. Don't put up your hands. Anyone? Right? And anything, you, you, you know, you, just, you say, it's part of aging. It's part of aging. So it's very normal. Amen. The, for the world, it's normal. As you progress in your days, so shall your infirmities be more. As your days increase, they also increase. That's the norm of the world. But this promise in the Bible, and that's why it's a promise, and God wants us to lay hold of it. As your days increase, notice the word days plural, as your days increase, so shall your strength be. Amen. You got to repent. You got to change your mind about the way you think. Your best days are yet ahead. Amen. I don't care how old you are, your best days are still ahead. Amen. Amen. Your best days are still ahead. Amen. Praise the Lord. So shall your strength be be. So shall your strength be. There is a Japanese man by the name of Shigeaki Hanoharara, something the last. I'm sorry, but the last one is Hanahara, something like that, okay? And uh, uh, the, the first part is Shigeaki, okay? Anyway, he's a, he's a doctor, and his father is a, a Christian, he's, he's a Methodist pastor. He just passed away a few years ago at the age of 105. So when asked, all right, about his secret, he says, every morning, olive oil. Before I heard about him, our pastors, we learned this in Israel in, uh, was it, 1990s? We learned about it already. Olive oil. Okay, he says olive oil. He swears by olive oil. Another thing, use your stairs. We all use leaf, right? He says, go up the stairs. Even in his old age, he go up the stairs. He says, he go up the stairs two steps at one time. Try one first, okay? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And if you read online and all that, they won't tell you that. He will tell you it's his faith. But it is faith in God's Word reading God's Word every day that gives this man his health. He's a Christian. They won't even tell you he's a Christian. And that's the, the, the main part that's not being shared out there in the world. Because the world don't want to acknowledge that. Hmm? I have a Korean friend who just went back to uh, South Korea and uh, before he went, he told me his mother, his grandmother is uh, nearing, uh, I think, 800, 100 and still reading the Bible, still going to church, always telling him, make sure you go to church. So I told him, next time you go back, you ask her, that I ask, what's the secret? He said, okay. So he came back after the holidays, and he says, my grandmother says, uh, read the Bible, <laughs> and drink plenty of water. <laughs> you know, this lady, he said that her, her mind, her wits and all that is very sharp. No Alzheimer, nothing. You know, they say it's very normal for your, right? Guys, they say that your prostate enlarges, your brain shrinks. <laughs> don't accept it. Yep. Amen. I said, don't accept it. Amen. Amen. As your days, so shall your strength be. Amen. 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 So, this is an amazing promise, but let's look at the context. I believe in context. Maybe we can learn some things. So, God wants your spiritual strength to increase. God wants your physical strength to increase. Amen. God wants your moral strength that you're, you're a person that people look at. They want to be like you. Amen. Not just your physical health and strength. Come on. Amen. More importantly is the beauty of the insight. You look at some ladies, right? They are certain age, maybe in 70s. And there's a beauty of, that, that goes beyond age. Goes beyond makeup. 
And that's the thing that can never grow old, that part. If you continue to grow in Christ. Amen? And it's true. Everything the Bible says don't do, if you do, you grow old faster. You get angry, always get angry, you grow old faster. Amen. You're happy, happy, merry heart, you, you stay young. A merry heart does good like medicine. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like medicine. The word medicine there is the, the, the word marpe. They shall be life and health to all their flesh. God's word. That word there, life and health, is marpe. Health to all their flesh, marpe. It's medicine. Medicine to, and it's good medicine. Notice, but a broken spirit causes osteoporosis. <laughs> now, you won't find that in the scientific world. But I'll tell you this. This is the wisdom of God. A merry heart does good like medicine. So be happy. And you know, best of all, where, where you try to make yourself happy all the time, find every excuse to be happy. Joke, laugh, smile at home. Find things to laugh about. Remember when you dated your wife, you made her laugh so much. Amen. And then you got her. Okay, and then she cry all the rest. Then, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and you make her cry. No, Pastor Prince, no girl, no cry. Okay, <laughs> that's a song, huh? So, by the way, I, I'm reminded of uh, a man called Norman Cousins. All right, like cousins, like cousins, or his name is Cousins with an S. Norman Cousins, you can find it in Wikipedia. Not now. Okay, this Norman Cousins in um, um, some time back, 1964, he was diagnosed. He's a professor who later on became an author to write about, you know, uh, the, the method by which he obtained healing. All right, but what he said was this. He was diagnosed with a crippling connective tissue disease, which gets worse and worse until you die. And uh, they call it uh, ankylosing spondylitis. I'm trying my best. You know what he did, this professor? He checked himself into a place where he has a lot of funny videos back then. They use uh, videos and he has tapings of it. And it's all humor. And he has a lot, he took a lot of vitamin C and laugh and laugh every day. The, oh, by the way, you can see this on his... Uh, Wikipedia on Norman Cousins, the doctors gave him one in 500 chance to lift. He took a lot of vitamin C and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh his way right into healing. Right into healing. Amen. That's the world. We have something better. Rejoice in the Lord. It says, Paul writes like this. Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. You know, when a pastor st your pastor stand up here and preach to you and say, well, I've heard it before. Well, for them, it's not tedious, but for you, it is safe. Amen. It's for you, you know, it's not for them, you know. For them, for them, it feels tedious. I'm sure they've heard of this before. Uh, but I'll say, it's not tedious. Why? I love you. God loves you. And for you, it is safe. Amen? Amen? Jeremiah 15, 16. This is what he says. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. The first thing, your first assignment is not to look at the, the word of God and say, what must I do? All right? That's a law mentality. The first thing you do with God's word is you eat it. It's for eating. It's for eating. If you ask the Lord, all right, why is it that people are rebellious, people are, people are, are, are bound by addictions, people are enslaved to uh, certain uh, habits, and uh, they can't break free. Why are people depressed? Why are so many people depressed today? Right? You know what the Lord say? They are hungry. So many of you are hungry, but you're not feeding yourself with true bread. So you pass by, you think you eat, need something from the fridge. You open up the fridge, you feel like you need to eat something, you feel hungry. You don't realize there's spiritual hunger because you've not been feeding on the Word. So you take out something, you eat. Now, after a while, you still feel hungry. So you eat some more. 
oh, I watch TV. I think oh, this is good. Yeah, I watch this drama. I watch this uh, movie. I watch this. All right, it will feed me. After for a while, your mind is stimulated, no doubt. All right, you are stimulated. But after that, you, you, you finish everything, you still feel like there's an emptiness. Like, what is it I really want? I think I need to watch some more. You know, it's not the answer. The next day, you have uh, raccoon eyes, you know, or panda eyes and things like that because it doesn't feed. So the Bible says in Isaiah, why, why spend your labor for that which does not satisfy? Now, all these things, eating and all that, or watching, you know, I mean, it all has its place. I'm not knocking them. They are not sins. It's not a sin to eat. I'm just saying, realize that you are hungry. And you might say, Pastor Prince, I, I, I think I'm hungry for more, more of the social media. I, I feel that the more I read, I, I think I feel better. No, you won't. You'll feel empty. You'll feel more depressed. You are hungry, and you are hungry for true bread. You are hungry, the Bible says in Isaiah, why labor for that which does not satisfy? Amen? So you are hungry. You are not depressed. You are hungry. You are not, uh, you're, you're not actually uh, uh, a rebellious person. Amen? You, you are fighting something because you are hungry. Have you noticed know people who are hungry physically can be very bad-tempered? <laughs> Wives? Have you noticed that? Sometimes your husband is not angry with you. He's not angry. He is hungry. Look at your husband smile and say, Amen. <laughs> Have you experienced that? Yeah. Or oh, it's just me? It's just me. Come on. I see Pastor Lawrence putting on his hand. He's one honest man. That's one honest man. The Lord loves it. The Lord loves honesty. Amen. Amen. So many of you need to repent. <laughs> Amen. So a hungry man can be a very angry man. Right? But the anger is not actually his problem. His problem is a deeper problem. He's hungry. The enemy always attacks your food. The Bible says when Gideon was threshing wheat, he was threshing wheat in a place, in the vine press. Now, that's not the usual place that you thresh wheat. Threshing wheat is like studying the Word of God. The Word of God is wheat, right? Bread of life. So he's threshing wheat to eat, right? But he was doing it at night, to hide from who? The Midianites. The Midianites have come in and every time there's a harvest, the Jewish people have a harvest, they will come and rob them of their harvest. So they are, they are staying in the mountains and whenever the harvest is there, they come and rob them of the harvest. So Gideon does it quietly so that he has a secret harvest and a secret threshing and a secret reaping, right? That he wants to have secret eating as well, but God called him forth. God calls those who are studying the Word. Amen? To feed others. Some of David's mighty men became mighty men. They marked themselves as mighty men when they refused to let the enemy take their harvest. They will stand in the middle of a, of a patch of a field of harvest like lentils, all right? And they will stand there with a sword and they, they are outnumbered by the enemies. But the Bible says the sword will cleave to their hand. And the sword is a picture of God's Word. And they will fight. They say, this is my harvest. You ain't taking it. Amen. All right? There's no way. I, I saw it, all right? I grew it, I watered it. And where were you? You want to come and take the food? No way. I'm going to stand here, stand my ground. And the Bible says, stand therefore. Stand for your food. Amen. Amen. Don't let anything rob you of that time that you, you spend in the Word of God. Amen. Whether you're in the, in the morning, whether you're sitting on the toilet bowl or like I told you, it's a good time. Some of you, oh, I, 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 you know, I feel so irreverent. No, you're just being religious. Because I'd rather you do that than not do that and spend the whole day not in the Word. So if a Bible there, Bible everywhere, amen, commercial time, look at the Bible. Spend time in the Word. Even a little piece of it can, like a little crumb, can bring healing. Amen. Can have a good amen. amen. So here God says uh, there's food. N not just drink, there is food. Right? By the way, uh, Jeremiah was saying that first thing you do is you eat. And what happens? Your word was to me the joy. Your words were found and I ate them. That's your first response. But eat the word of God. And number two, it becomes the joy and rejoicing of your heart. So eat it until there's a joy and rejoicing springing up. Amen. And there's a joy I'm telling you. It's like that joy heals, by the way. That joy heals your body. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's not just spiritual strength there. If you read it carefully, it's strength, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. So the joy of the Lord. So how do you get the joy of the Lord? By words were found. And what did I do? I ate them. Amen. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, 
What do you do with bread? You eat it. You don't just admire it. Or else you stand up, I'm the portrait of life. Right? I'm some, but he says bread. He says he's the water of life, fountain. Amen. He is the bread of life. What do you do with bread? You eat. And because called, I am the bread of life, you receive life. Amen. You see, every day we lick, we lick life. You know, the things that we do, the things that we watch, the things that we hear causes us to leak life. You know, I thought life is intact. Once you get life, you get life. No, every day you're losing life. Ask the doctors. They'll tell you it is shown by death has set in. That means what? When there's no life, that part, there's death. So different parts of your body, when you leak life, right? Death comes in. They call it aging. They call it whatever, which means what? Re reduction of life but you can receive more life. Jesus says, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. Can I have a good amen? amen? So, praise the Lord, give Him praise. Amen. It's true. Amen. He wants you to have this life more abundant. Amen. And if you look, there's also food in uh, the land. In the, remember I, I shared about the land and the Bible? The land of wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. In my last sermon, I, I broke this down to show you the Word of God and uh, how, how rich it is. A land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. You shall not like anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose heels you may dig brass or copper here uh, in the Hebrew. All right? So it's a rich land. Amen. It's a rich land. It has different vistas, different facets, uh, and every part of it is a blessing. So sometimes you go... For the Lord your God brings you. So it's a land that you go into. So there are times you take a verse, you meditate on it until it gives you its, its, uh, its uh, iron and its, its uh, precious metals. Amen? Gold, silver is there as well. The Bible says more to be desired is the Word of God than gold. Amen? But as you study God's Word, you find that there are times you, you, you're eating pomegranate. There are times you're eating figs. God has variety. God, 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 God is a God... A variety, the manifold grace of God. Even grace has manifold. You know, God gave you a tongue. You know, you, you, you'll never know the different tastes. If God gave you one tongue with one taste, you won't complain. You don't know. You don't know. You only have one taste. Imagine rice, same. All right, you eat beef, it's the same. All right, you, you, you have uh, your pickles, it's the same. All the taste is just one taste. But God gave us a tongue with many tastes. And recently they discovered there's even one more taste called umami, hidden somewhere. <laughs> Amen? Umami. All right? I'm sure there's somewhere else, I prophesy to you, if they study some more, there'll be another one called udedi. Oh, that one is... <laughs> oh, Pastor Prince, you're so corny. <laughs> Amen? There's an umami, there must be a udedi somewhere, you know? All right, so there are things that, and they say that our brains, we only use 10% uh, uh, of our brains, right? Amen? Have you met people that you, you don't even think it's 10%? <laughs> don't look at your neighbor now, amen? All right, it, 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 I mean, scientists tell us that we only use 10% of our brain. So I believe that the other ninth fan, right, where is it missing? The Bible promises the gifts of the Holy Spirit are exactly nine. Amen? It comes when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it can maximize your mind. So it, is, it covers every area. Yeah? Fix is for certain... By the way, do you know fix is very sweet, right? Just let you know something about fix. Fix is very sweet, but it does not spike your blood sugar. It does not. In fact, it is said that, that uh, even uh, people with uh, high blood you know, sugar and all that, they can actually eat fix. Amen. Don't Google it now. Go home and, you know. And uh, so it's amazing the land, whatever God promised down there, is good for the taste as well as for health. Amen. Amen? If you're a man and you want to be fruitful, <laughs> either of you used to hear. All right. Pomegranate is very good for you. That's why it's a lot of seeds. Okay, I'm getting myself a hit, right? Okay, that's just free, okay? Just free. Amen? Look at the pomegranate and ask yourself why is it full of seeds and all that. I believe it's going to be helping you. That's all I can say. <laughs> Either that years to year, let him hear. Amen? Amen? 
<laughs> okay, so that's a promise. Now that is uh, microscopic. Sometimes we study the Bible, we study the Bible up close, all right? We, we, like a microscope. And sometimes we study the Bible like a telescope. Here we, we look at, uh, at, um, at uh, Moses when his last stand on Mount Nebo, just before he passed on to be with the Lord. Right? He stands at Mount Nebo and he looks into the promised land in Deuteronomy 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah. Many of you have been there. Let me see your hands you've been there. In Jordan, where Moses' last stand was. Let me see your hands. Yeah, you're blessed. Amen. You saw that, that view? You are seeing the same view where Moses was. Somewhere there, he stood at Pisgah, Mount Nebo, and then he looked into Israel. So today, of course, it is on the, the side of Jordan. Okay, the country of Jordan. But um, at one time, it's all one, right? And they looked down. He looked down into the promised land. And uh, here, uh, it says that, uh, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead, so as, as far as Dan. So he looked, he looked like this. Okay, I'm looking at the promised land. This is Jordan. I'm looking at the promised land. So he started like this. He looked at Dan, as far as Dan. Then he looked at Naphtali, which is the area of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, right? Now, he could have looked straight away up front. You know what's up front? Jericho, the nearest. The city of Jericho, the area of the Jordan Valley. But he didn't. He, he looked far, right? So this is a picture of the overview of the land. Sometimes you read the Bible. You read the Bible. Um, you, you don't feel like reading like microscopic or meditating on one verse, right? You, you want to just general reading. Like you read the book of Ruth, it can be done in one sitting. It's a very romantic book. Amen. It's a beautiful story of a, a young bride. In fact, not only a young bride, you know, usually a, a woman who has been married before, it's not so much, uh, uh, it, it does not stand so much an opportunity as someone who has not been married before. She's been married before. And uh, in, in those days and age, uh, when your husband dies before you and all that, they could, have, they could see you as a person who brings a curse. Right? But then she followed her, her mother-in-law, to a land that's foreign to her and end up marrying the most eligible bachelor. And together, they became the great grandfather of David. And from David came our Lord Jesus. <laughs> Imagine if they, they didn't meet. And she, she doesn't belong there, actually. Like the Syrophoenician woman of Tyre, she's a Gentile but she was included in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful story? Amen. You can read it in one sitting. So it's like a panoramic view. Amen. A panoramic view. Something you just feel like reading. And what the panoramic view does is that it washes you. All right? You say, well, Pastor Prince, when I read the Bible, I really don't understand a lot of things. Keep on reading and enjoying it. You know, I, I, I tell you this, a lot of people who start reading novels, even children when they start reading books and all that, there are parts they don't understand. But just enjoy what you do understand. All right? There, there was a, 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 a man who, uh, who was a devout, a devout Christian, and uh, he wanted his son to learn about the importance of studying the Bible, reading the Bible, and he, told, he, he was a farmer. He told his son, and they had a stream nearby their farm, he told his son to take a basket, right, a basket, and uh, go collect some water. The son looked at him, kind of strange, right? He was about, the son was about seven, eight years old, and he was trying to impress on his son because his son told him, when I read the Bible, I don't understand. I don't understand. So he said, tell you what, go get the water. So the son went, scooped the water, came back. Of course, the water dripped out. I mean, it came out, right, of the rattling basket. Then the son said, Dad, it's all gone. Go get some more water. He went and came back again and the water all left, you know, and nothing left. He said, Dad, it's useless. You cannot take water in this. You see, son, how clean that basket is right now. Even though it cannot hold water. You don't understand the Bible? Never mind. Keep on reading because it washes you. It washes you. It has a washing, purifying effect. It has a healing effect. Same thing if you're honest. You say, well, I, I don't want to read anything I don't understand. If you're honest, because we, have, we talk about reading as eating God's Word, apply that to your eating. Do you understand every food in its components that you eat every day? Oh, yes. Over here, we have vitamin E in this little bean here. And, and this chicken rice here, 
right, has this, you know, do you go down all that or you just enjoy? When you approach God's Word, have the same approach. Don't try to understand its components and all that. Just enjoy. And many a times, God will speak you directly from something that happened in the past. Are you with me so far? Is this helping you? God even told Joshua at the commencement of his uh, ministry or his career as a, the captain of God's people to bring them into the promised land, the land flowing of milk and honey. Moses just died. Joshua took over. But the very first thing that God told Joshua was this. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. What's the result? You'll make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Amen. Good success will never take you away from your family. Amen. Good success is not looking at the, at the chart day and night, amen, until your eyes are swollen. That's not good success. Good success is not having like, you know, you, you, good success will always give you time to serve the Lord, to come to church even on Sunday. Amen. amen. To serve the Lord, amen. And it seems like uh, money is working for you not you working for money. That's good success. You, you'll make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. But Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart of your, out of your mouth, but you shall meditate. In other words, people, listen. There was an enemy out there. In the promised land, there were enemies. The same 40 years ago, remember? They saw Anakims down there. They were still there. The same enemies were still there. If anything, they are more established now, more entrenched in their fortified strongholds. And we know the walls of Jericho are thick. So the enemy is there. The hurdles, what seems insurmountable hurdle, even more so at that time, at that season, because the river Jordan is now overflowing its banks during the time of harvest. Talk about the time to, to, to cross. It's the worst of times to cross the river Jordan. So you have a natural obstacle. But you know something? Whatever is in front of you, whatever obstacle, whatever enemy, you are not to be engrossed with the enemy, Joshua. You are to be occupied with my word. What an instruction to a leader from the very start. Don't be occupied with the enemy. Don't be occupied with the troubles and the obstacles. Be occupied with my word. And you will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. <clears throat> Amen. You know, there is a law... I think it's in Deuteronomy that says that when a king ascends the throne, his father passed on or whatever, he ascends the throne, the very first thing he must do is with his own hand write the law, the book of the law, which is the first five books of Moses. He need to write it with his own hand that he may learn to fear the Lord all the days of his life. Listen, that's number one. That he may fear the Lord, that he may humble himself and not lift up himself above his brethren. He's king. He's king. And yet, writing and being familiar with the Word of God. Amen. I'm not asking you to write the entire Bible. All right? It's really written for you. Amen. But instead of asking and, and passing that responsibility to a scribe, the king himself is supposed to write. And then the next result, like I said, is that he will humble himself. He will not be lifted above his brethren. And the third one is, is amazing. The third one says that he and his children, the king and his children will live long. His, his, uh, his career will be extended. He and his children will live long. All the result of the Word of God. Be occupied with the Word. And many of us, because we're not occupied with the Word, amen, we're not meditating on God's Word. We are meditating on things that we see, uh, you know, on, on TV, right? And now, now, especially with Netflix, so abundant everywhere, available. Now people are just occupied with, with evil. A lot of stories are uh, evil, because evil draws the flesh. Amen. Before we know it, we are occupied with evil. We are occupied with negative things. We are occupied with scandals and things like that and, and, and the bad stuff and, and gossipy spirit. And before we know it, we, we are occupied with this. And the Bible says we are transformed by beholding the glory of the Lord. Where do you find that? In His Word. We are not occupied by looking at the glory. So I'm not saying uh, uh, don't spend time, you know, watching or things like I'm, I'm just saying, make sure occupation is your mainstay. What are you doing most of the time? Do not neglect the Word of God. Amen. 
And, and of course, one of the best ways is that, you know, the Bible says God gave gifts to the church. When Jesus ascended, He gave gifts to the church. Amen. And, and one of the gifts are pastors and teachers. Why are they there? To teach the Word of God. So it doesn't mean that God teach me direct, I get revelation direct, I don't need anybody. No, no, no. That, that, that's a, 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 an attitude of pride. It's not teachable. God raised them. God raised pastors and teachers. And uh, they, they face the same problem that you face and they have some experience that God allowed them to go through so that they will have the riches within them to dispense to you. So not only the Word of God, but the Word of God worked through a life already. So especially those older men. And I consider myself <laughs> one of those with advanced age. I have many years of experience behind me. Amen. But when you, look, when you see older people and they are teaching the Word of God and you can see the anointing of God to, in them to teach and to impart revelation, that transforms lives and it's proven. There's a proven track record. Cling on to it. Amen. Not for the person's sake, but for that ministry, that gift. Amen. That gift is from Jesus, the ascended Christ. He gave gifts to men as He was ascending. He gave gifts to men. Some uh, 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 apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Some put pastors and teachers together because a pastor is issued a pastor and a teacher. Right? But there are also teachers who are not pastors. So, they are there to teach. So when you say, I, I, I got my own revelation. No. Humble yourself. Listen to the teaching of God's Word. Amen. Amen. Be near. Be near. Any, any spout, like a pipe coming out, if, the, if, if, if here is a trickle, don't have to worry about that. Go to the places where the... Where, be under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. And park yourself there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So one of the key principles I want to leave behind with you also is to remember that uh, um, the things that we are teaching as a church, right, in this church in particular, we believe we are majoring on what is major in the Bible. Now some might want to like uh, uh, study certain things that are more specific. You know, every, every word of God is profitable because every word of God is God-breathed. Amen? It's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Reproof, no one likes to hear reproof. Correction, there you have it. No one likes to hear that, right? But we never learn from our people complimenting. The compliments never help us grow. They make us feel good. It's when people correct us. And many a times, it's people who love you who correct you. I'm not talking about those, uh, you know, people who are uh, taking cheap shots, right, through social media. I'm not talking about that. Those are not people who are they are always looking out for, for, you know, things to say. People are not happy because the grass is always greener. Somebody's marriage always looks nicer, always looks better. And, 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 and social media now is pushing this agenda. Amen. So that you will, you will be in a place of depression. You'll be in a place of, you know, having mental health issues. Everyone's life is good except mine. Cut off the thing. Don't spend. Too, I'm not saying okay, cut off completely. I'm just saying that don't spend too much time. Don't be a slave to that. Your life is more important than to get involved with who is who and who is who is the present girlfriend of this guy and who is like you know. Hey, your life is more important. Your life is important. Time is precious. It's passing you by. It's flitting by. When I was in Switzerland, I was in New Zealand with some of my, the brethren. We were there for ministry, and I told them to stop the car. Because it was so green, so beautiful. And I jumped across the fence and I ran. The hills are alive. I literally ran. It was so, I, I love nature. And, and it was so green. Green like you can never imagine it. It was so green. Literally, the grass, the grass is greener. So we were traveling on the road. I told them to stop. And I jumped over, ran across the, the green. And then I stopped. And, and the nearer, once you're on the other side, you see some things. I look around, there's this brown, brown stuff <laughs> all around me. Brown, brown everywhere, not a drop to spare. <laughs> anyway, it's like some are dried, some are fresh. And I look at my shoe, my, my nice shoe, and it's like, oh no, what have I... I mean, I didn't see it from there, all I saw is green. And I realized that the grass is green on the other side, but you don't see it from where you are. Introducing the new Joseph Prince app. 
We've designed the new app with one thought in mind, to make connecting with the Lord daily simple and easy for you. Through the guided daily experience, spend time in His presence and build a habit of starting your day right with the Word of God. Let's pray this short prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your deep love and detailed care for me. I'm grateful that you value me so much and that you know even before I ask what I really need. Help me to remember that no problem or need is too small for you to handle. I bring all my cares to you, knowing that you are attentive to every little detail of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, everyone is looking to amuse themselves. They are engaged in social media because there's a constant craving to be amused. Musing is opposite from amusement. Muse means you are silently contemplating, meditating, so shut down everything else that will distract you. Spend time, bring up the Word of Scripture, meditate on it, and the Word of God will release health, life, prosperity into your life. Thanks to the support of our gospel partners, the daily experience is now free for everyone. Try it now on the brand new Joseph Prince app. Download the new app today. Do you want to live a life of purpose? A life fulfilling that destiny for which you are called? Oh, you just want to make money. I want to make money. I don't care how, you know, my health suffers and all that. All right, I want to make money. I don't sleep well, never mind. Money. Money, money. Or I just want to live for pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Each one of you, you were birthed into this world with a purpose and a calling. Amen. I, I want to really impress that on you because I want you to not find your purpose and calling later in life. It'd be too late. Yes, God can restore the years, but you missed out on what could have been. You know, there's a saying that uh, you climb the ladder of success. Make sure that the ladder of success that you climb to the top is on the right building. No point climbing a long, right, tall ladder all the way up. It's a long way up, and then finally you find yourself on top, but the wrong building. Amen? And the years have passed. And I, I, I feel that you need to know your calling, you need to know your purpose. And the calling is given, like the Apostle Paul says, God separated me in my mother's womb to reveal His Son in me. And yet the Apostle Paul, um, you find him chasing down believers, thinking that he's doing God's service by killing Christians or bringing them, throwing them into the, into the dungeons, into the prisons. And he's thinking that he's doing God's service because these grace people, they are just advocating lawlessness. Amen? We keep the law and uh, we need to stop these people. And he doesn't realize that he was coming against the Lord. And when the Lord appeared to him, the Lord says, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. The goats are the, the instruments that they use to prod a bullock from moving on the field. So, he started pursuing the Apostle Paul, who was then Saul, thinking that he's doing God's service. But you can see that all the gift things are already showing up, but in the wrong direction. Amen? He grew up at the feet of Gamaliel, the, uh, the best rabbi at that time, and he wanted to learn about the Word of God. Why? Because there is a teacher, there's an apostle in the making. Right? But he was, his ladder was on the wrong building. Amen? He didn't believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and God had to deal with him. So when the Lord met him, the Lord says, it's hard for you to keep against the goats. Try your best. Something sharp, 
a knife, kick against it. <laughs> you only hurt yourself. So a lot of people think that, you know, they hurt the cause of Christ, they hurt Christ when they blaspheme and all that, or they use the name of Jesus in vain. You only hurt yourself. The Lord cannot be hurt. He can touch a leper, and the, he doesn't catch what the leper has. The leper catches his healing. He cannot be affected or be defiled. Amen. So you use the Lord's name in vain. You see your friends doing it, whatever. They are hurting themselves. Amen. Because angels, they revere that name. They honor that name. So just like the Apostle Paul, there are people who are, they love, like, uh, you know, they love uh, ministering to the kids. They might be studying psychology for kids in school, right? Mental health and things like psychi uh, uh, psychiatric. Uh, studies, it's because there's a calling to join rockets. Amen. And, and you will find your fulfillment in life in your calling, in that purpose for which God birthed you into this world. And you know what? It will not be a struggle because if God calls you into the area, God has equipped you with all the gifts, the anointings, with all the charisma tasks that go with it. Those who say, actually, I don't want to serve, you know, as an usher. I don't like meeting people. Listen, it, it, that's not your calling. You don't have a joy for it. It's not easy for you. It's a burden for you. Some people, it's not a burden. Some people, <laughs> welcome to church. <laughs> so good to see all of you. Uh, that, one, that one is called. <laughs> we just need to restrain him. We just need to pull him back. <laughs> Amen. We need to pull him back a bit. Are you all with me so far? but you got no joy. Whatever it is, there'll be a joy, there'll be a flow. Amen? But in the natural, it might seem the opposite, but sometimes your weakness is an indication of your calling. Like for example, I, I had a stammering, a stuttering problem for the longest time in school, both uh, elementary as well as high school. I'm speaking for our friends overseas, right? And, and that's a, as a teenager. You know how embarrassing it is in front of the, all the girls and all that? But when God called me, and I gave him my, my tongue, my voice, my vocal cords, and I told him to use it. I was, I was appalled. I was amazed. It shocked me that when I stood up, there wasn't that stuttering anymore. So some of it will come, some of it is an indication that you are called for that. So don't just shun it as you go along. But there must be, if you say, I, I got a voice to sing. How many people believe they have a voice to sing? Right? And they insist on singing on, in the pulpit. But when they sing, they have a ministry of clearing the church. And they, they really think people have gone to their corners to pray. No, they've gone home. So if God, God calls you to be... Amen? He'll give you the voice. Take my advice. There's a book called Ecclesiastes. And it starts off by saying, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Who is that? Solomon. So why is that book there? That book, when you read that book, you can get depressed. <laughs> if you, don't know, you don't, know, don't know the purpose for that book, you'll get depressed because it starts off by saying, and remember, when you study the Bible, the key to the book of the Bible, what the Bible, that book is all about, whether it's Ephesians, whether it's Genesis, the key is always at the door. The first few lines, the first chapter, the key is there. Like Genesis, what is, is it all about? In the beginning, God created that. So it's all about the book of Genesis, beginnings, the beginnings. Amen? So, likewise for Ecclesiastes, in Hebrew, Kohelet, which is preacher, a preacher. But then it starts off by saying, the key is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What an opening. That means in Hebrew, havel, havel is vanity. Empty, empty. Take it from someone. This book is there for a purpose. It is showing you if ever there was a man who has achieved everything, whose cup of the world, pleasures, worldly pleasures, and anything that you can enjoy in this earth, this side of heaven, and he has the ability because of his position, and he was the most powerful king at that time, and uh, his domain was such that he extended the farthest ever for Israel all the way to River Euphrates in Babylon and uh, all the way to Israel. And he's, uh, 
his domain, his power was so vast and his wisdom was so admired. People came from the Far East to come all the way there. And then the Bible says that uh, uh, even uh, the kings of the East look up to him. His, his wisdom was, was, uh, was far exceeding the kings of the East. And the wise men of the East, think about all the, the wise men of China at that time of names of, that y'all, y'all can just quote, you know, we still read some of their books and all that. And uh, even in history, we know about them. Well, wisdom of Solomon exceeds all that because he asked God for wisdom. So think about a man who has wisdom, who masters all the languages. And in Ecclesiastes, he says that, I tried singing, I tried music to find fulfillment there. All right? He said that it gave me nothing. Vanity is empty. I tried. Now, in terms of fulfillment, right? God gives all music and things like this for us in our lives to enjoy. Amen? But not to find fulfillment in. So it starts by vanity of vanities. Another phrase that appears often besides vanity of vanities is under the sun. Under the sun. So remember this. The next book is Song of Songs. It's about the one who is above the sun. Once your eyes and focus and priorities in life is on the one, the son of God, who is above the sun, Amen? You'll be fulfilled. Amen. He tried everything. Amen. He is a man. You know, he wants something. He says, he says that in Ecclesiastes. He wants something. He'll get it. Amen? He has uh, 700 wives and uh, 300 concubines. There's 1,000 women. One year. Work out the math. Imagine the mother-in-laws he has. That part isn't the wisdom of God operating. So he has the wisdom. You'll see that yet at the same time, there's a, there's a natural wisdom. And then he says that as a man, there's never been a man who can try anything and everything. It was the most powerful. He made his own law. Even the richest man today is bound by the laws of the land. He can't just go in, you know, but he had everything and anything. He tried everything, he said. He tried horticulture. He tried buildings. Everything came to emptiness, he said. So the book is there for all of us to learn because sometimes as a, you know, as a guy, we start thinking, you know, oh, you know I, I want to achieve this. Then I'll be fulfilled. If I make X amount of dollars in my life, this is my financial statement, then I'll, I'll rest. I'll be happy. And the Bible says Jesus shared a parable about uh, such a person who built. And then Jesus, Jesus says, but that night God says, He said, I'll build greater buns. He's planning without God in his mind. And the Lord says that, God appeared to him and says, Thou fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Think about it. Ecclesiastes is basically telling us what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but he loses his soul. Amen. Amen? But when he looks at the one, he says everything is vexation of spirit but then he's looking within himself. He's looking at all the, the earthly pleasures and don't, 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 don't misunderstand. Many of these earthly pleasures and, and uh, uh, like food and all that, all that's given by God. Yes, Amen. Amen. <laughs> but he had access to all of them. He looks for fulfillment in them and he came up by saying, it's all empty. But in the next book, it's a song of songs. Why is it a song of songs? It's a song that, song of songs means a song beyond any other song. All your love songs that you sing, boy-girl songs, romantic songs, it's not at that level. This song is a song about all songs. Amen. Why? Because it's a song about the Son of God. Amen. And His love for you. It's a, it's a romantic and lovely uh, song. Amen. It starts off by let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Amen? So it is like, let me experience his love, his personal love. That's when you find the fulfillment in life. Amen. So don't, don't, don't make the same mistake, you know? You, you, by the time you arrive 60 years old, 60 plus, you say, oh, I got my, my, uh, my financial statement uh, there already. Amen? I can rest. And then you find that you got other battles, maybe health-wise. And now you're trying to use all the money you made to get back the health you lost. Vanity of vanities. Amen? Enjoy the Lord now. Amen. 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 Find out more about Him now. Amen. He's the only one who can. He comes to us saying that I am the water of life. He told that woman at the well, you drink this water, you'll thirst again. And by that she knew what He meant because she was looking for love in all the wrong places. 
Amen? But did God give us relationship? Yes. In the beginning, the Bible says, God made male and female. Amen? And, and, and a man shall leave his father and mother, and they too shall become one flesh. God ordained marriage. So marriage is of God. Right? But God, God is telling us, even in your marriage, and this is the key to uh, having a successful marriage, is actually not look to your spouse to fulfill your innermost desires. Yes, there are other, other desires you have, other ones and all that, but look to the Lord for only what the Lord can give. Amen? Amen? Don't make your, your spouse your God. I pity those who don't have the Lord. Because they look at their spouse and they draw from their spouse and the, the spouse also draw back from them. So they can't get it, they hammer them verbally. And then they can't get it, they hammer back, you know. Because they are drawing, they are looking to each other. Why they can be so hurt by each other is because they are looking to each other for the fulfillment. And when it's thwarted, they don't receive what they want to receive, they transfer that to their spouse. It's because of her. I need a new spouse. You get a new spouse, guess what? the problem is still there. Amen? Because you are still there. Okay, Pastor Prince, start preaching, Pastor. Wait, let me mess up first. I'm standing on your foot. I just want to stand there for a while. I just want to tell you. It's for your it, 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 church. This is what, you know, studying the Word of God is all about. Don't pursue things just to make money. Are you sure that if you have the extra million, okay, another five million, now million is nothing. Oh, I want a billion. You sure you'll be happy? You sure? I mean, there's a, there's a guy who is, more, is worth more than a billion. To date, he's still probably trillionaire. But maybe more than that based on, uh, you know, uh, inflation and all that. You look at Solomon, he's the richest man in history. If he's here today, he's richer than Elon Musk. Plus no restriction, he was king. Absolute sovereign on the throne. By his word, a man can, be, can die. By his word, a man can be saved. In those days, like Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign. You think about it, people. The purpose, the calling, the destiny that God has for you. It's a beautiful destiny. Flow in it. Can I have a good amen? Amen. God has given us an armor. Okay, I want to impress on you how vitally important it is of the very last importance that you understand and have this armor on. Especially when you're going through all those times. All right, bad season where everything seems to go wrong. And I mean physical things as well. Put on righteousness as a breastplate. Show them the breastplate now. The breastplate, when you put it on, it protects your vitals, your heart especially. And that's what the devil attacks all the time. You know, even when you, 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 do, some, when you do something wrong, right? It's obvious he attacks you, he accuses you. Look at what you did. Call yourself a Christian, right? You, 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 are, you are no use. Compared to your friend, look at so-and-so, same age as you, but this person is well off. You know, look at you, you know, you are no good. You, you are just that. You know. And all this self-condemnation, he's attacking what? Which part of you? Your heart. That's where the conscience is, your heart. Accuse, accuse. Even when you don't do wrong, he'll find something to accuse. You haven't done this enough. Haven't prayed enough. Haven't done, read your Bible enough. Okay? Now, reading Bible is good. But you see, I, I, I like to say it like this. People ask me, is reading Bible important, Pastor Prince? I say, yes. But you know, you say that... Uh, it's not reading Bible enough. You know? No, no, what I'm trying to say, you see, reading Bible should not, not reading Bible should not make you feel guilty. It should make you feel hungry. It's like, I've been void of wisdom. All of a sudden, the things I know is not all blank out. I need to get back into the Word. This is my source of wisdom. This is truth. Objective truth in a world that people are trying, man whose breath is in nostrils is trying to come up with their truth. Sorry, man. You are too small, too young, too short life for me to trust. It's not proven yet. God's Word is forever. Amen. And the one who wrote it is all wisdom. Amen. So when your truth contradicts this truth, who do you think you are to sit in judgment of His truth? The wisest man, when he was a boy of 12 years old, 
Where was he found? Physical attendance. <laughs> in the church. He didn't sit at home. The parents didn't say he's too young la, for the Bible. He's too young. The, the devil doesn't think he's too young for porn. The devil don't think he's too young to smoke. The devil don't think he's too young to be exposed to the things of the world. The devil lets him have it because he knows the younger they get hooked, you got him hooked for life. Now, we've covered the breastplate. Why is that an important weapon? I'm going to show you a prophecy. By the way, it's not, how many established? It's not our righteousness. The devil said, are you sure you've done that right? Are you sure? Or you remind something that you did wrong? That's it. Your heart is no more protected. No, it is that gift of righteousness. Because the whole thing is His armour. It's His righteousness, therefore. It's not, it's, not, it's not subjective, which is what I do for God. It is objective, what God has done for me. It is all the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's why all the gospel pieces is the gospel truth. It is based on accomplished fact. Fait accompli. That's French. Accomplished fact. It's a finished work. It's a done deal. Okay? So the breastplate, go to Isaiah 54. Let me show you this. It says, In righteousness you shall be established. Now, I'm going to ask you one question, okay? You have been hearing pastors standing down here preaching to you that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, right? I mean, come on, you're in this church, you're bound to hear that. All right, am I right? Now, do you think that God gave you this gift just for you to uh, be glad that you are righteous before God with His righteousness? Do you think so? Do you think that's what God wants for you? Or do you think that God wants you to use it every day? Especially when you fail, you have done something wrong, you feel so lousy, and before your, the devil attacks your heart and your conscience, just remind yourself, thank you, Father. I am not my own righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Oh man, that's the time. That is the time. Martin Luther says that the time to really believe that you are justified by faith is also the hardest. In his commentary on Galatians, he talks about it's the hardest. Why? Because when you're being tempted, he says it's very hard to believe that you are justified by faith. To him, he says it's he used the word very hard. And yet it is the truth. Because we are so used, you tell us, you know, you do wrong, you, you are wrong, we understand. You do good, then you are good. We understand. But you tell us, even though you are in the midst of something that you, you are struggling with on the inside, some hidden anger, hidden lust or whatever it is that's coming out, and, and you must say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I, I, pastor, I don't feel it. I, I, I'm not it, Pastor. That's the problem. You need to study. You need to pursue righteousness. Pursue means not try to become righteous, but study the gospel righteousness, which is a gift. Okay, so let me ask you this. I didn't, I didn't ask, do you know righteousness? I'm going to ask you now. Do you enjoy being justified by faith? Every day. Every single day. When you fail. In your relationships. Do you enjoy the fact that you are justified by faith? Amen. Everybody is looking for this, you know. They, 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 they might not be able to say it, but they're looking for righteousness. Deep down, that's why they don't want to see God and all that or hear about God because they, they want to convince themselves God doesn't exist or whatever because they know that if, if there is a God, my life is, is a mess compared to His standards because instinctively, they all know God's standards. The Ten Commandments is written on their conscience. The book of Romans tells us. They know they don't measure up. But what they don't really know is that God loved them and God sent His Son to die on the cross so that it is not based on what they do, it's based on what He has done. Isaiah 32. The work of righteousness will be peace. Some translations like ESV, NIV says, the result of righteousness. So the work of righteousness means what? Whatever righteous, the, the effect, the effects, the, the result of righteousness will be what? Peace. And what is peace? It's not just shalom. Shalom is not just mental peace. It is also wholeness, nothing lacking, nothing deficient, complete. In every area, it's a very beautiful word. Jesus is the Prince of Shalom, Sar Shalom. Hmm? So the result of righteousness will be peace, 
And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. If anything we need in this life, I'm telling you, if all that's going on in the world, and all that's going on in our individual world, in our family world and all that, it's so good to be able to walk in the midst of all this peace, quietness, and assurance. I think people like this, right, will not fit the category of type A temperament that doctors say is more prone to heart attack. I think people like this, right, peace, quietness, and assurance forever, even when things go wrong, they're not prone to stress, the bad kind of stress, chronic stress that causes your BP to go up. Hmm? And I think it promotes health. And today, even doctors are telling us there's a body-mind connection. They found out that women with breast cancer, some of them who experience a, a, a terrible uh, divorce, all right, and, and, and usually quite a number of them develop breast cancer. Now, that has, that's a study that's been done already. And it's still being done. I tell you this. Don't ever allow anyone to rob you of your peace. Amen. And that can only happen if you forgive that man. You forgive that woman. Don't have any bitterness in your heart. It's a hindrance to your peace. And your peace is your health. Yeah. Why should you let anyone take your health away? They don't deserve it. But you deserve it. Let them go. And you let yourself go. And Jesus says, go into peace. In other words, this is how you keep your healing and become healthier even from now on. Stay in peace. So church, be established. I didn't ask you whether you know it. I said, are you established in it? During warfare, when things happen, the devil says, you are just a hypocrite. Call yourself a Christian. There's a time to say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. When you feel some, some mere human being, mere mortal, whose breath is in his nostrils, I don't care his position at work or whatever, if he says something against you and you feel crushed and all that, just stop and say, I'm the righteous, I'm the child of God. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Who is he? What then does his words matter compared to the one? Let me show you what hope, Bible hope is like. Bible hope is that, it's not like, I hope so, lah. I hope it will happen. I really, really hope it will happen. No, Bi when you have Bible hope, it will happen. Amen. And God wants you to raise your hopes. Bible hope. The word Elpis, Greek for hope. Just remember Elvis, remove the V to P, you get Elpis. All right? Amen. And it rocks. And I tell you this, you will never roll. Amen. Your burdens will roll, but you will never roll. Amen. Sometimes you shake, shake, rattle, and roll, but you can shake, but the rock you are on never shakes. Make sure you are planted on Christ. The solid rock. Amen? So it says, uh, in, in uh, the definition of LP is, it is the positive, confident, joyful expectation of good in your future. That's how we are to live. We are to live life with a joyful, confident expectation of good. Now, right now, I wonder what's your disposition, your mental disposition. Are you having thoughts like, it's going to be a good future. I see good in my future. Or are you filled with what the media is saying and what the world, and some of it is based on what is happening that's negative around the world? Are those thoughts dominating your mind? Because this is what it looks like with the absence of hope. If there is no LPs, amen, you wake up every day depressed. All right, you feel morose. You don't look forward to your work. You feel more tired than usual. Amen. You look at your marriage, you look at your family, and you feel tired. You feel a sense of despondency. In other words, depressed. You are depressed. Depression has different forms, but it is the lack of hope. Maybe you still have a bit of hope, you have a bit of depression. No hope, complete depression. At night, you can't sleep. You wake up in between your sleep and then you start thinking all kinds of thoughts. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen to this and that? My children and this and that. Oh, I'm now at this age, you know, what's going to happen now? You know, what's going to happen if something happens to me? 
Or why do I have this pain? Why is this pain continuing? That kind of thing. So it's that you see bleakness in your future. You see uh, all kinds of darkness in your future. That's not good. There's an absence of hope. Where do I find hope, Pastor Prince? Here. Romans 15 verse 4, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have what? Hope. Every time I read the Bible, people, I always leave the Bible feeling like, ah, life is good. You see, either sin will keep you from God's Word or God's Word will keep you from sin. The same thing, amen, you find that you are more depressed, you are uh, very morose when you think about the future, you are, you, you are dejected, you know, it's only darkness you see that. Most likely, you're not spending time in the Word. Sunday sermon is good, but it alone is not enough. Man does not live by bread. How often do you eat bread or rice? Or ramen? Or chapati? Every day. You don't just come once a week right, and eat your bread. So Jesus himself says, man, can, there's no way you can live just by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And all the people said, Amen. okay, let's talk about the recession. Whether you know it or not, the world is going into a recession. Okay, how do you find hope? You find hope in wherever you find that the Bible says there's famine. The Bible talks all about famine. Even we are blessed with the blessing of Abraham, just because you are blessed with the blessing of Abraham. You see Abraham, Definitely the person, the original person we get the blessing of Abraham from is the story of Abraham. If you are Abraham's seed, then are you blessed? You are blessed with the blessing of Abraham because you are Abraham's seed. You are Abraham's seed in the sense that Christ came from the lineage of Abraham and God says, in Christ shall all the nations be blessed. And if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. So you look at Abraham. He, did he go through famine? Yes. Just because he is blessed did not, does not mean he... He will not, he will not, he'll be exempted from famine. No, he went through. In fact, God wants us to go through to show the world what he's like. Yeah. The world can see that we are not exempted, but we thrive. We flourish. So every time you read about Abraham and his son Isaac, Isaac is even amazing. The Bible says, in the year of famine, he sowed and he reaped a hundredfold. So much so that the Philistines around him, the unbelievers, envied him. They were jealous of him. He had a very healthy uh, marriage. He was in love with his wife. Amen. And all their wives, Abraham's wife, Sarah, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, they were all beautiful. Amen. If we say, oh, that, that doesn't really matter. Then why does the Bible tell us that? Amen. And now we have, to, we have to see our wives as beautiful. It's part of the blessing of Abraham. Amen. Enjoying ourselves in Christ. Praise the Lord. God has given us richly all things to enjoy. Praise God. Amen? So you see, you find hope in looking at all these patriarchs and how they live during famine, what they did during famine, seeing that the Lord blessed them and you are the seed of Abraham. You have hope. And I've shared this with you that the very first way of studying the Bible is to see Jesus. Right? See who? Jesus. Many a times we look into the Bible, and I did that you know, in my early years, to find myself. But you can't find yourself. Yeah, you can find yourself in a sense, that, you know, uh, in a corporate way. But, but when you find Jesus, you find yourself. Why? Today you are in Him. Once you're born again, you are in Him. And all that He is righteous, you are righteous. That's why it says Christ is made unto us. It's in our benefit to know who Christ is, what He has, what He possesses. Praise the Lord. Amen. We are joined as with Christ. He is made unto us for our profit. You can say it that way. He is made unto us right wisdom, righteousness, holiness, even holiness. Christ is our holiness. Joseph Prince is not his own holiness. Christ is my holiness. And when I believe that, it manifests in my actions in my life without me being aware of it. So once you see this, you want, you want to see Jesus more and more. You want to see Jesus more and more, right? And it's all throughout the Bible, like, like, like when God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son that you love. But wait a minute. Abraham has two sons at that time, by then. The older one was Ishmael, through a slave girl. Right? And the other one is his, his true wife, Sarah, Isaac. And now God is saying, take your son, the on, your only son, your only son. So one thing, God's eyes does not recognize what is born of the flesh. Only what is born of the Spirit. Number two, God was referring to another son. Only son, 
sounds like only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. So when you read that, ah, oh, and you see Jesus, right? Or you can read that and say, well, God wants me to give up my Isaac. What's my Isaac? Your Isaac is that you spend too much time watching Netflix. That's it. Lay your Netflix on the altar. <laughs> Amen. Your Isaac is golf. You are fixated with golf. You watch everything there is and you try your best to play all the time. Amen. You neglect your family. Put it on the altar. Now, all these are things that I'm not saying it's not uh, uh, things we can learn from, but they are not the primary um, purpose of that scripture. It's to unveil Christ. So God said to, God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son that you love, and offer him on one of the mountains I'll show you off. And so happens that mountain is where Jesus was crucified. In Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. You know what's the highest peak of Mount Moriah? Calvary. And that's why just before Abraham plunged the knife, God stopped him. God didn't want a human sacrifice. Anyway, Isaac's blood is tainted with sin, as every man is. God wants to see whether he was obedient. So God stopped him. God says, now I know that you fear me or love me. Now I know that you worship me. How? Because you have not withheld your son, your only son. And then God showed him a ram behind. I believe Abraham had a vision. How do I know? Because Jesus later on says to the Pharisees, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. When was that? Then the Pharisees said, you're not yet 50 years old. You saw Abraham. They missed the point. They say, you saw Abraham. The lesser always see the greater. No, he says, Abraham saw me. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Then he said this, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Amen? So I believe Abraham turned and he saw Jesus on the cross. Now, I'm going to tell you something about the ram caught in the ticket. Why must the ram be caught by the horns in the ticket? Number one, it's a mature ram. It's not a lamb. It's a mature ram. Male lamb. It was caught by his horns in the ticket. Why? Why is that important? Because to offer God a sacrificial lamb, the lamb must be without blemish. Are you listening? If the ram is caught by its fur, it will be lacerated. It will be blemished. But that lamb was caught by his horns. No ram gets caught by his horns. They are mature. Doesn't just plunge into the ticket. He did it on purpose. He, did it. he wants to be caught. Jesus laid down his life voluntarily. Amen. Without blemish. The offering was without blemish. Amen? So when you read the whole story, I remember years ago when Jessica was about uh, nearly two years old, she had a viral infection many years ago. And, and when I went back and I cried because uh, the doctors gave her injection, you know, in uh, the children's hospital and all that. And we brought her back and the doctor said, must bring back for another test. And I said, I, I don't want the problem. I, and I prayed and I did everything I know how. Then God brought me, uh, then when I went to my room. I needed hope. And I just opened the Bible at random. So it's okay to open your Bible at random at certain times. Just know that, you know, you keep on opening it, it says, uh, you know, Judas hung himself, and then you, you open another one, it says, go and do thou likewise, all right? Don't do it, okay? But it's desperate time. We're <laughs> desperate time, couple desperate measures. God talked to me, and I opened up, and it, it fell on Genesis 22, the offering of Abraham. And I read that. And all of a sudden, I saw how much God loved his son. God was saying, I'm going to give up my son my only son, the son that I love for you. Amen. Amen? And that's why we can say to God today, because while there was a hand that stayed Abraham from killing his son, there was no hand that stopped God that day. Right? God gave up his son for you. Right? You'll never know how much God loves you until you know how much God loves his son, because he gave up his son for you. So I read that and I saw how much God loved his son and then all of a sudden I was lost in that love story, amen, in the whole passage. I forgot, Jessica was still crying next door and I forgot how help Jessica's affliction. No, I, I went there to pray and to search for an answer but I got lost in the story of the Bible. Now I'm going to show you how practically seeing Jesus can bring you practical results in your life, even healing. That I was, I, I've been wanting for my daughter. So when I saw how much God loves me and how much God loves his son, he gave up his son, now we can say to God, now I know that you love me because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Amen? 
Just like God said to Abraham, now I know that you love me, you worship me, because you have not withheld your son, your only son. As far as God is concerned, it was done. Amen? So when I saw that, I started crying. The love is so beautiful. No love drama you watch can come close. Amen. See, the reason you, you are married is to demonstrate Jesus loving His church. I speak a mystery. It's about Christ and the church. That's why God gave you marriage. Oh, marriage is like our… Jesus and the church is like our marriage. No, your marriage is like that. You came after. So Abraham's story is about father-son. The first love, and the word love was first mentioned in the Bible there in Genesis 22, is the father's love for the son. Second is two chapters after Genesis, uh, chapter 22, is chapter 24, is the story of the bride and the, the bride and the husband, right? And the word love is used. That's Jesus and his bride, romance. That's man and woman love. Amen. So chapter 24 is about, about the Holy Spirit, the unnamed servant looking for a bride for the master's son. And this has happened for 2,000 years already. The Holy Spirit is still forming a bride for the son who is soon going to come and take his bride home. Amen. Amen? It's like the Jewish custom. Jewish custom didn't, didn't come after God. God instituted Jewish custom to demonstrate his style of doing things. In those days, uh, once you are betrothed, you are engaged, you go build your house while waiting for the time. The father will decide when you get married. That means you're about to get married, but you don't know when. If the father says, today is the day, go get your, your bride, the guy will go and get his bride. The bride might not be ready, but the, the bride might roughly know around this time, but she's not ready, but she's ready every night. Amen. And that's what we are doing right now. We are waiting for that to happen. Very much like the Jewish wedding. Anytime he will call for us. Amen? Woo! And it's just the introduction. So as I, as I wept, Jessica stopped crying next door. And she was completely healed. She fell asleep. The next day, she was completely well. Just seeing Jesus, instead of being engrossed with my daughter, I was very concerned for her. I was now pleasantly distracted by the Lord to be Christ-occupied, focused on Christ, and all of a sudden, she got healed. The very thing I'm focused on her, praying, demanding, commanding, healing, and all that, came supernaturally natural when I focus on Jesus. I don't care how bad it gets, God will take care of you. Amen. Just because you are His own. Can I be good? Amen. Introducing the new Joseph Prince app. We've designed the new app with one thought in mind, to make connecting with the Lord daily simple and easy for you. Through the guided daily experience, spend time in His presence and build a habit of starting your day right with the Word of God. Let's pray this short prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your deep love and detailed care for me. I'm grateful that You value me so much and that you know even before I ask what I really need. Help me to remember that no problem or need is too small for you to handle. I bring all my cares to you, knowing that you are attentive to every little detail of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, Everyone is looking to amuse themselves. They are engaged in social media because there's a constant craving to be amused. Musing is opposite from amusement. Muse means you are silently contemplating, meditating, so shut down everything else that will distract you. Spend time, bring up that Word of Scripture, meditate on it, and the Word of God will release health, life, prosperity into your life. Thanks to the support of our Gospel partners, the Daily Experience is now free for everyone. 
Try it now on the brand new Joseph Prince app. Download the new app today. Perhaps right now you are facing a time where whatever you're doing is not working anymore in your, in your work life or in your profession or wherever you are in your studies. It's like, you know, it's like not producing. It's always having it comes up empty. If you're in that place, you're like the disciples toiling all night catching nothing. Experience. They, did, they, know, they know where to be at. They know the, the seasons of that, that year, all right? And they know uh, where the best fish is. I mean, it's, it's not a big lake, actually. You think about it compared to the Lake Geneva and all that. And yet, all night, they caught nothing. And Jesus came on the scene. Jesus says, cast your net on the right side. Does it matter if all night they catch nothing? You cast on the right side, left side, but because Jesus said it, they did it. Whatever He says to you, do it. Amen. And in the wedding, the water turned to wine. And over here, they caught so much fish that John was the first one, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He practiced Jesus' love for him always. And he says, so when you practice Jesus' love for you, you are the one with a quick discernment. And he says, it is the Lord. Then Peter jumped into the water to go to Jesus. Amen? You see? You see the priority? Jesus first, not the fishes. Not the profitability in your company. Amen? But was there profitability? Was there success? Earthly success? There was. Jesus didn't come by and say, guys, you didn't catch anything? No. Good. Now you all learned the lesson, right? Sometimes, you know, you go through emptiness. You know, they all knew, you know, the Jewish people back then, the Bible is very clear. They know what is blessing. They know what is not blessing. When God says, I, I will bless your grain, wine, and oil, they knew that was blessing. Today, we preach that, they will say, prosperity gospel. When God blesses your grain, wine, and oil. Now, I'm against, like I said, materialism and loving money, but I think the truth is somewhere in between where people need to know that God wants to supply them. Yes. Amen. And supply them with more than enough so that they can be a blessing. Oh, amen. amen. I, I don't believe in, in uh, people that, that talk about giving to them and then uh, 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 or give to me and then uh, God will multiply things to you. I mean, they, this is a big, uh, you know, these are the things that turn people off. But don't throw away the, the, the baby with the dirty bath water. This isn't there's a truth. Amen. If you don't believe in prosperity, God prospers His people. It's not a priority. But even in blessing this, Jesus gave them a net. And this time around, it didn't break. But a net full of fishes. The Bible says large fishes. And this time, the net didn't break. The first instance, Jesus introduced Himself right to the fisherman. The net broke. Because He says, drop down your nets. He wants them to believe big. Expect more. He says, let, Jesus said, let down your nets. Nets is plural. Peter says, I'll let down the net. No wonder it broke. There's more supply than your need. Amen. There is more health and healing than there is sickness. Amen. There is more forgiveness of sins and grace than there is sin in your life. Now, preaching like that, where you put your faith in God and you boast about God and who He is, brings accusation. This is the gospel of grace, where you have more faith in the grace of God than in sin. Amen. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm not saying needs don't exist. I'm not saying poverty don't exist. I'm saying we look at God and we look at His supply and His fullness. Amen. The, the land that you come from, the resources that you have, is the means by which you can bless the country that you're in. If you are sent as an ambassador to a country, you don't leave off the riches of that country. You don't leave off the resources of that country. The country can be poor, but you can be well supplied because you are not sponsored by that country. You are sponsored by the country that sends you. Amen. Amen. And you are there to do good. Amen. Supposed to. Amen. But the doing good is is authorized not by the country that you're in, but by the country that authorized you, that sent you. Amen. Can I have a good amen? amen? So knowing that we go into a world that is crying, sighing, dying, you know, sick, lonely, 
and we bring the supply of heaven. Amen. And that's why Jesus says things like when He appears on the scene, He says, the kingdom of God is here and the sick are healed, the blind see, the dumb speak, and those who are lame jump up for joy, leaping and praising God. Amen. The kingdom of God is here. So Jesus, His feet was planted in Galilee or in Jerusalem at that time when He said that, but He's in heaven. Wherever He is, heaven is there. And if you have Christ and you all have Christ, heaven is all around you. Amen? Let me show you this verse. It says in uh, first, uh, John chapter 1, and of His fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Just let you know that this, His here is our Lord Jesus. Of His fullness, of His fullness, out of His fullness, amen. His fullness we have received. And grace for grace. And the word for is anti or anti, right? Grace for grace. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Because anti can also be, be in place of. In place of grace that, that has been used, another grace comes. When that grace has been used, another grace comes. I was meditating on this many years ago and God gave me this illustration of this wave. Amen? Grace. Once that grace is used, another grace comes. Grace upon grace upon grace. And you know where you are? You know where you are? You are Pastor Matthews, by the way. Can you see Pastor Matthews on there? He looks like Elijah the prophet. Amen. He's contemplating whether to open up the sea or not. Amen. He's contemplating really hard. And I missed the illustration I was going to tell you. Anyway, what, where you are when the wave was coming in, you know where you are? You are there, right under it. So one grace is used, comes on you. God doesn't run short. Amen? It's not impoverished. Another grace comes. That's what it means. Of His fullness have we all received and grace for grace. There's a grace for everything. Amen. You don't feel it now. You say, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think I want to have kids and all that. I assist my friends and all that. They cannot go to holidays as freely as they want to. I don't want to have kids. Listen, God will give you the grace. What you don't have right now, God will give you the grace. Amen. I don't feel like getting married. God will give you the grace. In every stage of your life, grace will come. Then all of a sudden, after you enjoy that grace, I wish I had kids earlier. I wish I had married. Amen. I wish I had learned about grace earlier. You look back. There'll be grace for every level of your life. Every stage of your life. Are you with me so far? Now watch this. The next verse says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, I've been, this, I always say this one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The law was given, and you can give from a, you all know me, I mean, you all must preach after me. Really. The law was given, and given can be what? I give you a, a message. I can give. You receive it. I give you. But it can be from a distance. But grace and truth came. Now this part must step down. One step only. One step. <laughs> grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came. Came is what? Personal. Amen? Uh, what, what is interesting is that ever since I started preaching this, there are people who, who will try to dispute this. And uh, instead of one side the law and given by Moses, the other side is grace and truth by Jesus Christ, they say that, oh, you see, grace and truth. It's not just grace. It's truth. They divide grace and truth. My friend, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Amen. Grace and truth is on one side. It came through Jesus Christ. All right? Law was given by Moses. The, the, the division is not between grace and truth. It's between the law on one side and grace and truth. The law says do, do, do. Grace says done, accomplished. Find out about it. Walk in it. Flow in it. Even salvation is done. Amen? Learn about it. Receive it. Amen. Amen. And that goes for many other blessings. In fact, people who receive and receive are the ones who do so much. Like such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Unless you have received, you've got nothing to give. That's what abiding means. Except you are abiding in the vine, right? You can do nothing. The branch cannot produce. Worse, if the branch struggle and struggle and struggle, a little grip comes out. I don't even think so. The more you struggle, the sap is, 
is squeezed. You relax. You're not the supplier. You're not the source. Jesus is. The more you rest, the more He flows. The supply flows. We're asking the mysteries of how the golden calf came about. Because if you know this, listen, if you know this, you'll find the answer to your health, to your healing, to whatever you want to receive from God. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the, what was he up the mountain for? To take the, to bring down the Ten Commandments. Am I right? Right? The, on the two tablets of stone. Right? M Moses went up and said, God, the people are sick. God says, take these two tablets. Okay? So, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to Aaron, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Now, in those days, they wear golden earrings, okay? Remember uh, um, uh, Rebecca? The story of Rebecca I shared? Right? The moment uh, she, after she... She watered all the camels of Abraham's servant. Abraham's servant brought out a golden earring. Now, your Bible in the New King James, we all use the New King James here in our church, and it says gold, golden nose ring. So it can either be a nose ring or it can be a earring. All right, it can be both. All right? So, but I, I, I tend to incline more towards uh, earring. And for sure, this one is earring in the ear. Why? Because it's break off the golden earring which are in the ears. <laughs> Alright? So it cannot be a nose ring. So, and anyway, in, 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 in Genesis, it's, and the next one says, so all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears. Emphasis. Right? Break off the golden earrings. So the next verse says, verse 4, drop down. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. They said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So, the golden calf, we think about, oh, it's an idol. It's an idol, okay? It's a, it's a golden idol. It's more than that. What does it mean today? What is a golden calf today? What is a golden calf? Does that mean you cannot be creative if art and all that? No. No, observe. They made a golden calf. He received from their hand. In Stephen, the Martha's account, Stephen the Martha, when he preached his famous sermon, look at it. He says this, saying to Aaron, make us God, okay, referring to the same incident. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in what? In the works of their own hands. They rejoiced in the works of their own hands. That is the problem. Today, that's the same problem. Men rejoice in their effort, their strength, their smarts, their qualification. I'm a self-made millionaire. All right? Instead of trusting God, giving God the glory, looking at God as the strength you know, of their life, they're looking at their own self as the strength. If it's your strength, it has an expiry date. Amen. You'll fall flat on your face. Even the young men, that's what I compare, the young men shall fall, and, and young, young men shall run, and they, they will fall. Those that wait upon the Lord. They shall run and not be weary. Amen. So God is saying, don't trust your own strength. So the law is all about what is natural and what is naturally strong for men. You shall not, you shall not use your own strength. And the very strength leads you to sin. Nothing wrong with the law. But combine your flesh, it brings you to sin. Read all about it in Romans 7. All right, Paul had this experience. So um, let's go back to it again. So if that is so, if that is so, we're talking about the key to receiving even healing and health. If that is so, what is this golden earring the devil wants them to be free from? Take away the golden earring. Remove the golden earring. Earring sounds like what? Very good. This church is so smart. Amen. Earring sounds like children. Hearing. Golden star. Golden earring. So the word gold is divine. So something divine there. Are you listening, people? So they sacrifice their golden earring for the works of their hands. Now, watch this. Go back to the story. I'm going to show you the interlinear now. Okay, look at the golden earring. One more time. They break off all the people. Now, this is the form that you're reading from right to left, Hebrew. And they broke off all the people, the earrings of gold, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. 
Okay, this is how it reads. Notice that before the earrings is the word Aleph Taf. For those who know, it's referring to Jesus Christ. That's why the devil doesn't want them to have the golden earring. It's the hearing of the word of Christ. It's not just hearing any word, it's hearing the word of Christ. So back to uh, uh, Galatians 3. How many want the Holy Spirit? And here it says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Is it by your effort? By doing this religious work or by doing that work or even good work? No, you don't receive the Holy Spirit like that. You receive the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith. And hearing of faith is hearing about Jesus Christ. Okay? Hello? Amen. Romans 10, 17. Real quick. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing through the Word of Christ. Now, some people say, the Word of Christ means when Christ speaks to you. Yeah, of course, faith will come when Christ speaks to you. And Christ still speaks to us today. Amen. But this is not what it's referring to. It's referring to the context that refers to a preacher preaching about Christ. NIV brings it up. So the message that is heard, and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. That's how faith comes. You make sure that wh wh whoever you're listening to, whatever message you're listening to, uh, the social media today is full of uh, sermons as well. Make sure it's about Christ. Amen. The centrality of Christ. That's how you, you, you have the hearing of faith operating in your life. And when the hearing of faith is there, what's, what, what's going to happen? You will receive the Holy Spirit. Then he asked this question, Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it, indeed it was in vain. Next verse. Therefore, He, God, who supplies the Spirit, and the word there is constant supplying. God who supplies to, uh, the Spirit to you and works miracles. And the word works is also constant. Constantly working miracles. You want God to constantly work miracles in your family, in your life, in your workplace, in your church. Okay, that, that's what it's all about. Why are we missing this? Because it tells you, does God do it by the works of the law? By the work of our labor, our effort, at, at, at law keeping, even though it appears so nice to people outside, all right? But it's all a mirage because you know it's going to lead you into sin. But all by the hearing of faith. Which one? I submit to you, that's the reason you don't see miracles often in people's lives, in churches, and all that. It's because of this. They are still under the law. But they'll say, we're not purely under the law. I agree, they are under the same Galatian, Galatianism problem. All right, they embrace grace, but they still keep the law. It's worse. You have enough grace to deceive yourself to think that you are under grace, but you put in the law to nullify the effect because now you bring in grace and you put it into your old wineskin. You will lose both, Jesus said. This is Jesus' ministry, and I'll close with this verse. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching, preaching, say preaching, the gospel of the kingdom and healing, say healing, all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So the people came to hear, so Jesus preached. They came to hear and to be healed. Remember this, always remember this. The norm for the believer is to hear first and then faith comes and then you receive. If you're not receiving, ask yourself, are you hearing the word of Christ? Make sure it's the word about Christ. That woman, the issue of blood, when she heard about Jesus, she came in the press behind. Amen? I'm going to read to you a real quick testimony and then I'll, I'll, I will dismiss you, okay? Right? All right, sister from Singapore. This just came a few days ago. I was born with a defective left eye with scars across my retina. Hence, for 55 years, I could only rely on my right eye to see. My only good eye. However, uh, my only good eye, however, is highly myopic and I had also suffered from acute glaucoma in that, some, in that same eye once. My eye is seeing something else. Okay, same eye once. My eye doctor fears that over time, due to severe myopia, my retina, which has become stretched and thin, will develop scars to term myopic degeneration, which could lead to blindness. I work in an international construction company and my job requires me to do close-up work on the computer and read construction drawings. Recently, I suddenly could not see clearly with my, my right eye. There was a diagonal patch across my visual field. And my vision became so bad that I could not read text on my phone and laptop. And I could not walk down the stairs because I could not see well. I had to inform two of my colleagues of my situation so they could help me, as I was seeing very little and my eye was in pain. During this very tough season, I was listening. I was listening. I was listening. Are you listening? Yeah. 
During this tough, very tough season, I was listening to Pastor Prince's various sermons on Gospel Partner. In one of his sermons in 2002, he mentioned the higher way is to believe, the higher way to healing is to believe what God said in His Word, just like the centurion who approached Jesus for the healing of His servant. God also led me to meditate on His promises. Faith arose in my heart as I kept hearing and hearing the Word of Christ. You see, I, I saw this uh, testimony only last night. I prepared my sermon already. But you see how it comes together? Even the Word of Christ. Faith arose in my heart as I kept hearing and hearing the Word of Christ. A couple of weeks later, during one of the Sunday services, Pastor Prince prayed for people with eye conditions and I received the healing for myself. The next day, I realized the diagonal patch across my visual field was gone. I could... Listen, hold your claps. This is the last one, right? I could, I could read the text on my devices and even type out this testimony to testify of the amazing miracle of God in my life. May all praise and glory be to our Heavenly Father. Praise the Lord. I just want to drop one thing in your heart about Kairos, okay? About right time, right place this year. The thing that He wants us to do, and this is what He said to me very strongly. He says, my people need to learn to pray and get more into prayer. Now, the moment I say that, some of you are saying, oh, you know, it's very hard. I don't have the time and all that because you have this religious idea about prayer. Your idea of prayer is that one hour prayer or two hours prayer, like you hear some men of God, they kneel down there, they pray for one, two hours and three hours or whatever it is. And there's no way I can do that, Pastor Prince. No, I'm talking about communication with God. The, one of the... Uh, most outstanding things that the disciples saw about Jesus is that at any time, he, He'll talk to God. At one time, they were persecuting Him and all the, He was talking about the cities that rejected Him. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum and all that. At that moment, He lift up His eyes and He says, Father, I thank You that You've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent of the world, but You've revealed them unto babes. He praised His Father and He turned to His disciples and said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. While he was being persecuted, while he was being rejected by all these towns and villages, amen, he was rejoicing, talking to the Father, and then looking at the disciples and says, Come unto me, all you that labor. Oh, the beauty of the man. Amen? Amen? Some of us will be crushed. Uh, I pray to you another time, Lord. Now I'm just crushed. Right? And they saw very freely he can talk to God. Anytime, even when you're driving, but pastor, I must close my eyes. Don't. <laughs> so all these religious ideas come into your mind. Amen. And, and, and I want to say this. Okay, listen carefully, especially for this church and those that are following this ministry. Do you, do you know that you can even allow the knowledge of grace to stop you from praying? Because you'll say, it's by grace. Like, grace will happen. Grace, you know? No, no, no. Grace is the idea you cannot, but the Lord can. It is actually conscious weakness. You will always, your, your place of strength before God, your place of power before God is conscious weakness. But don't stop there. If you're, oh, I'm, I'm so weak, I'm so weak, I'm so weak. No, no, don't stop there. But you need to know or else you'll be going around the mountain to learn the lesson that you are weak. You'll find that you fall and fall and fall until you learn that you are weak. People think they are weak, but they're not, they're not weak enough. That's why you cannot save a drowning person too fast. You cannot jump in the water too fast. Why? As long as he, has a, he still has strength, he'll pull you down. You must wait until he's weak. He cannot help himself. He cannot save himself. Then you can save him. We are still quite strong. We think we are, we are weak, but we are not. But we are actually weak. That's why all these all this daily irritations... God allows them to come in <laughs> so that you want to be more like Jesus. One of the best things you can do when you're arguing with your spouse and you're impatient and all you can think of is, is her fault, his fault, her fault, his fault, her fault, his fault, is to stop and judge that irritability in you. And tell yourself, I judge that irritableness. Joseph Prince, why are you so irritable? Don't talk about the rightness of the situation. Leave that for a while. Why are you so irritated? Why are you so vexed? Why are you so angry? I don't want that in me. I judge that. And then you realize, 
that has been taken at the cross. Amen. So, conscious weakness on one hand, and then dependence on God, on Christ. These are the twin, this is a power twin for victory in your life. So, Genesis 24 is this when the servant at the well, he prayed his prayer. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. So we all know the story, or you heard the story for the past uh, few messages that we have shared. Uh, the servant doesn't know which girl, the village has a lot of young girls, and they're all coming out at the same time to take water. Uh, usually they have two timings, early in the morning and uh, in the evening, all right, when it's less hot. And they will all come. So at a time in the evening, the Bible says, the Abraham servant, who was sent on an assignment by Abraham to look for a bride for Isaac, Right? He sat at the well. He doesn't know which girl, right? So he prayed, Oh God, give me success. The word there in the Hebrew is kara. Kara. All right? Which is right happening. Right happening. Good happening. Fortunate happening. The world calls it serendipity. All right? You happen to, happen to chance upon a favorable opportunity. Amen? That is what God, uh, uh, kara is all about. Right time. Right place. That's kara happening to you. So he prayed for kara. Give me a right time. Do you know God actually stopped for some reason? God actually stopped all the young ladies from coming out? That while he was praying, he didn't finish his prayer yet. He told God, the woman that will come and offer me water, the young woman that will come and offer me water, he thought that there would be many, many women that come and draw water, but the one that comes, Lord, the one that come and offer me water, and not only me, me water, but all my 10 camels. And one camel, 30 gallons minimum water. Imagine, she will also give them water. She is the one that you have appointed. He made it hard. But while he was still speaking, before he finished speaking, the Bible says, before he finished speaking, show them verse 15, and it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebecca appeared. So I want you to know something. We learned that prayer is mentioned with Kara. Prayer is mentioned. And it's not a long prayer. If you count the, uh, the, the length of the prayer, some of the most powerful prayers, short prayer. Yes, we have instances of Jesus praying through the night. Amen. We have instances of, of, of a certain uh, protracted prayer in the disciples' lives. We have a corporate prayer. They all pray together. But most of the prayers you see are short prayers. You count the prayer that Jesus taught His disciples, our Father who art in heaven. You count with a stopwatch. It's fast. But this idea, religious idea, you've got to spend hours in prayer, is not from God. At one time, we made a law out of one hour prayer. I still remember that. I tell you, I, I, I put a clock there. I started praying. I thought, oh, I don't know, one hour already. I look at my clock, 10 minutes. <laughs> but we don't do that. We were talking to our, our, our good friend, you know, um, in a cafe. We sit down there. And then we always say what? Wow, the hours just fly. How do you think God feels? <laughs> you know, right? You know, it's, it's com prayer's conversation with God. Amen. So you don't just dream, oh, by grace I'll have success, like, you know, by grace I'll have success. Did you pray? I said, did you pray? Oh, I'm going to talk to my son afterwards, you know, he did something just now. Did you pray? That God will give you wisdom, favour with Him, that your words will go deep. Did you pray? It's a small thing to pray. God is telling us. This is conscious weakness that I cannot convince him. But you only you can. This is a conscious weakness and dependence on God, dependence through Christ, that you will get through to him. Amen. Oh yeah, I, I, I you gotta make an important decision. You know, in fact, I, I was confronted with a number of uh, important decisions to make, you know, for, for, for someone else even. I gotta ask God, God, give me wisdom. But if I think that I'm smart, oh yeah, you know, let's go with the pros and the cons and the pros and the cons. And all the pros and cons cannot put you at the right time at the right place. We need to depend on the Lord. So the amazing thing is that before he had finished speaking, Rebecca appeared. So even when you are praying, God has answered. So God is outside the time zone. He sends the answer that you're gonna pray later on on, in, on this earth. He sends the answer before you pray because he knows you will pray. 
what do you think? Rebecca was cooking. Yeah, put in some turmeric, put in some chili powder. Well, so, oh, it's a very spicy food. All right, she's cooking and all that. Ah, I have, no, no watch. I have to go uh, in 10 minutes time. Look at sundial. Uh, 10 minutes time, I have to go and uh, take water and all that. Then poop, she disappeared. Then poop, she appeared in front of the well. And the, the elderly man is down there praying. You think it happened like that? No. God always sent the answer. Put the, put the desire in her heart. All right, and put the desires in all the other women, uh, young women's heart. All right, no, I have to do other things. I, I, I'm very busy. I cannot go to the well today. A brother can go to the well. Uh, some, you know, something like, something like that happened. So God was answering prayer before it was prayed. So the prayer that He put in, in your heart to pray, you think you are praying, but actually He put it in your heart to pray the prayer that He wants you to pray. And the answer is on the way. There's a beautiful promise here in Isaiah 65. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer while they are still speaking. And that's what happened to Abraham's servant. While they are still speaking, I will answer. You know what Jesus said when he taught on prayer? Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Wait, wait, wait. When do you believe you receive them? When you see it happen? When you touch it? You can feel it in your body? You can see it outside? When the manifestation comes? When? When you stand praying, Mark 11, verses, verse 24. When you stand praying, believe. What, sorry, one more time. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So when, when do you believe you receive? While you're praying. Is this, while they're still speaking, I will answer. I believe that when I pray, God answers. You gotta have that posture that, you know, you are, you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Again, all these religious thoughts and all that, you know, you got to find out your sin before you can talk to God, before God can hear you and all that, you know, and, and, and your unconfessed sin, right? That's why I'm, I'm telling you, this kind of consciousness can rob you of a prayer life. You got to know that you're forgiven of all your sins. Amen. And thank God for that. True confession is homologia, to say the same thing with God about our sins. What did God say about our sins in the new covenant? They are all forgiven by Jesus' blood. Confess that. The more you believe that, you won't fall into sin, I'm telling you. Because you won't be sin conscious. Before you fall into sin, you are sin conscious. Okay? Pray. God hears your prayer. You're a child of God. Pray. Every situation, pray. Be, be like, every day, it's not so much of hours of prayer. It is like the whole day, right? Any situation comes up, you are praying. You find you are lacking or something. Pray. That pain I felt in my body, Pastor Prince, can you pray for me? Did you pray? I felt it this morning, you got no time to pray. You got no time to pray. You got time to eat or not? <laughs> you got time to go to the toilet or not? When you feel the urge, you do it, right? Right? Prayer is so simple. God is so close. Nothing. That, you know, you got to demolish all these religious thoughts. You must get close to God. You must get close to God. You are so close already. You are in Christ. You know where are you not? Seated in Christ at the Father's right hand. So sometimes in times past, when I pray, Father, like God is so far away. Father, Father in heaven, I'm, 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 I'm trying to sight myself into a, a place where I think that I'm, I'm close to God. It never works. The more I try to be close to God, the more further I am. Because why? It's a negation of the truth. And the spirit of truth cannot bear witness with a lie. When, when he has... When he has, let me put it this way. When I'm already in Christ, I'm so close to God, the Holy Spirit bears witness with that truth. If I act like I'm so far away, amen, there's nothing for the Holy Spirit to bear witness. It's a lie. So when you act like God doesn't hear a prayer, God is so far away, or I didn't go to church for a few days or whatever, amen, then repent of that and just come back. And thank God that's forgiven you of that sin. I'm not attending physically. Okay, I'm just joking. All right? <laughs> you know, I got to slide in all the time, okay? I just don't want you to miss the corporate anointing. Amen, people? Amen. Pray. Amen. And know that while you're praying, not after, while you're praying, God is hearing. Today, I want to share with you about delay. Like if you're asking, Pastor, I've been praying. I've been praying for this. And I know God wants me to have this. It's in His Word. You have preached on it, Pastor, but I see it in the Word. For where is the manifestation? David sometimes says, has God forgotten His mercies? Why is He so slow? Have you forgotten me? 
Well, well, Abraham felt that way too, isn't it? Abraham, when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is the present-day Babylon area, Iraq, when God called him out, I'll show you a land, God says, and I'll make of you what? A great nation. How can you have a nation without posterity? Right? So God promised him, from that day, God promised him that God will make him a great nation when he didn't even have a baby. And Sarah had always been barren, even in her young age. And now she is 65 at the time. And he was 75 when he departed to go to the land of Canaan. Well, the Lord told him he wasn't perfect, was he? But God called him, you know. And think about it. If you were in Abraham's shoes, you waited year after year for your manifestation. God Almighty appeared to you. In fact, Stephen, in his address in Acts 7, in the book of Acts, he said this, the God of glory, I like that, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. When God appeared, God appeared to Abraham as the God of glory. I'm sure there was an amazing light effusing out of him, his being, his presence, when God said, I'll make of you a great nation. And yet, month after month, Sarah would cry. Wait. Become months, months become years. Years become a decade. Even a decade pass. And all these things going on. Please, I'm talking about you. And you believing God. And you asking the question, why? Because you are special. Because Abraham was special. Abraham was special. He looked around. He looked at the Philistines. Philistines' wives walking around. <laughs> Another one walking with wheelbarrow. <laughs> he looked around. Everywhere he went, every city he went. He went to Egypt. There were Egyptian women walking around, being carried you know, left and right by servants or slaves because they are so pregnant. Some of them are triplets, quadruplets, sextuplets, and they are just so full. And these are heathens. And, and Abraham saw all this, and Abraham says, the God of glory appeared to me. And it's not recorded for us how many times Sarah would tell him, what's happening, Abraham? Are we missing God? Now, I want to tell you something about the devil. The devil would turn your times of delay, all right, of non-manifestation into times of questioning God. If your faith is such that you say, I know my God, though he slay me like Job, yet will I trust him, all right? If your faith is like that, then he would, he would do the other approach. Something wrong with you then. There must be some sin in your life. There must be something you did maybe in the past, all right? that is now haunting you, that is now affecting this whole thing, you know there's nothing wrong with God, right? There's something wrong with you. Something wrong with your wife. Something wrong with your parents. Either you, you accuse at the drop of a hat. Every time something happens like this, he would do his very best to make sure you come under condemnation. Because condemnation is something that will cause you to repeat that behavior. Is it because of the wrong decisions that the baby was delayed? No, God was going to give him a revelation of himself that all the heathen women that walk around pregnant will never know. I find, ladies, who are believing God for a baby, let me tell you this. I find that in the Bible, ladies who are barren, when they believe God, and some of them long delays before they conceived, they always bring forth champions. They always bring forth champions. Sarah brought forth Isaac. Amen. Manoah brought forth Samson in their old age. Amen. Zechariah, his wife Elizabeth, the first two names you find in the New Testament. Zechariah, Zechariah. Zechariah means to remember God. Yahweh remembers Elizabeth, Eli, Shabbat. It means God's promise. God remembers his promise and brought forth grace, John, in their old age. In their old age. When the child is born out of faith, now most of the rest of them, they just, all right, get together, boom. 
Imagine a Philistine pass by. Hey, why don't you call upon your God? Pray to your God. Pray to your God. Huh? How, how do you think Abraham felt? Abraham looked around. Abraham wondering, they are getting manifestations or are they? Abraham, you don't know. You don't see their hearts. Yes, they have the physical thing, but that child is not a champion. Your child will be. I said, your child will be. When the child comes, wow, what a champion. Amen. You know how long Abraham waited? You know how long Abraham waited? Until finally Isaac came. And during this time, you know what he did? He did his best, you know, he listened to his wife. The wife says, looks like God doesn't want me to bear anymore. I mean, she, she, she literally said, God has restrained me from bearing. So when I go to my servant girl, Abraham says, okay. Abraham went to the servant girl and then got uh, Ishmael from the servant girl. After that, you know, uh, Sarah came complaining because now Hagar is proud. The maiden girl who got pregnant by her master, Abraham, is proud. Looking at her mistress saying, mm-hmm. All right, and now Sarah came to uh, Abraham and says, it's your fault, my wrong be on you. And I said, no, you blame me. You know, and then imagine all the quarrel they went through. All the while Abraham is saying, where is your promise, God? Where is your promise? What happened to your promise, Lord? Are you in that place? You know how long he waited? 24 years. 24 years, 24 years, just waiting for a chance to tell her how I love her and maybe get a second glance. But now I gotta get used not living next door to Alice. <laughs> 24 years. I, I, that's an old song, by the way. Y'all wouldn't know. Okay, this generation. All right. I sound so young. Praise God. Anyway, 24 years. That's how long he waited for all AB. But when the boy came, Hallelujah! He was a champ. And during this time, just before the boy came, you know what God did? You know the story? He went down and, uh, to this place in, in, in uh, a Philistine area. And the Abimelech, which is the title of the Philistine king, saw Sarah. And this time Sarah was about 90 years old. In other words, if God makes you wait, God, will, God is a God who restores if God makes you wait, God will keep you young. If God makes you wait, God will do something to your body that other women do not have. Because when she was 90 years old, something happened to Sarah's body. She was beautiful. That even a heathen king, and don't forget, heathen kings go by their eyesight. They have no spiritual discernment. So God literally change the physical beauty of Sarah, make her young again. Amen. And there was something else that the devil accused them of. Look, Abraham prayed for what? For God to heal Abimelech. In which area? For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. He's praying for open wombs when his wife is not even pregnant for years. So, the devil will try to make you feel like a hypocrite. But therein lies God's wisdom. When you don't have the manifestation, find somewhere and bless someone else with it. Pray for someone else. Pray for a blessing on someone. See what happened in the next verse, next chapter. I put it down there because it's all one continuous flow. All right, the next chapter says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. And why is it that this verse comes right after he prayed for the open wombs? Pray tell me, why do you think that is so? God wants you to know, do not stop praying for the sick even when you are sick. Do not, minister, do not stop ministering to people even when you don't have that manifestation. The devil will tell you, how can you? You are a hypocrite. Are you listening, people? 24 years. He start praying. I don't know whether he... God used him to pray for anybody else, but it's amazing. Maybe he was under accusation. I do not know. But one thing I do know, when he started praying for open wombs, his wife's womb opened. Sometimes we are so self-absorbed, my healing, my healing, my manifestation, my child's manifestation, my, my, my family, my family, that God wants us to break out of the self-occupation and start getting involved in praying for other people. 
If you are in a clinic, start praying for people that you see around you. Pray for that child, pray for that lady, pray for that man. Start praying. Amen? And you, all of a sudden you find your own stress level, your, your worry level, anxiety level just drops. Start praying for others. And God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. What the devil wants to tell you is that it's your fault something is happening because of this delay. It's your fault. No, my friend, listen. In the Old Testament even, all right, like Abraham's story, it wasn't because of Abraham's sin. Are you listening? God waited until Abraham could not. And then when Isaac came, all the glory goes to God. God waited until Abraham could not. But the thing is this, there was a lesson. When Abraham finally received his manifestation, listen, God told him, I'll multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And today, when I look, when you look around, look, 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 all this is the seed of Abraham. Abraham has more seeds than all those Egyptian women walking around, amen? All the, the Philistine women walking around pregnant. Abraham, today, we are called sons of Abraham. Best of all, Abraham started learning about who God is, this wonderful person that all these other people never got to know. Sometimes in the delays of revelation, and because he loves you, he delays so that you have a revelation that others don't have. Those heathen never knew the revelation that Abraham had. Isn't it wonderful? Hi, thanks for watching. If you are blessed by this video, let us know by liking it and leaving a comment below. And if you know someone who will be encouraged by this message, please share it with them. Feel free to subscribe to get more inspirational content like this every week. I'll see you in the next video.